Aloha. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Pamela Kao with the Thelma Parker Memorial Public School Library, part of the Hawaii State Public Library System in Waimea on the island of Hawaii. We're very proud to be the only library in the state of Hawaii selected to participate in the NASA at My Library, a program to promote STEM learning in our communities. Today, we're kicking off the statewide NASA at My Library James Webb Space Telescope Reading Challenge and celebrating the planned launch of the James Webb Space Telescope later this month. To help us do this, we're delighted to welcome Dr. Lori Rousseau Nepton, resident astronomer at the Canada France Hawaii Telescope and an instrument scientist for CITEL, one of the Canada France Hawaii's telescope instruments. Lori's research focuses on newly formed stars in nearby galaxies especially young and massive stars. Lori is herself a star in Quebec as she's the first woman from the First Nation of Canada to earn a PhD in astronomy. astronomy excuse me. Lori is Inu from the Piqua Cominuat community. And now without further ado, please join us in welcoming Dr. Lori Rousseau Nepton. Well, hello, Pam Pam Pamela, and hello, everybody. Uh, I'm super excited to be talking about the James Webb Telescope today. Uh, and as Pamela mentioned, I am a scientist who studies star formation, so newly formed stars that are currently forming in galaxies around us. Uh, and I'm specialized in studying them in what we call the local universe. So the Milky Way and galaxies nearby the Milky Way, our own galaxy. Um, but today we're going to focus on the James Webb Telescope and I'm going to talk a little bit about myself so you know me. And uh, in the meantime, I would like you guys to use the chat and tell me a little bit more about you, uh, how old you are, where you're from, and what excites you about space. Uh, so it'll help me uh, guide uh, you through this presentation a little bit. And I'm going to start sharing my screen and hopefully uh, in a few seconds, you'll be able to see uh, my presentation. So just give me a second here. There you go. So I hope uh, you can now see one of the slides of my presentation. And so we're going to see how the James Webb Telescope is going to explore the universe with a golden eye. <laughs> and uh, you'll see through this presentation why I picked that, that title. Um, this space telescope is an amazing uh, engineering endeavor that started in the 80s. Um, and we are very close to the lunch, which is going to happen on the 22nd of December, just before Christmas. So if you all are with your families on the 22nd, check out the, the YouTube feed or the news, you'll see the lunch as it's happening. And it'll take a few months before we get the first data because the telescope is going to do a, a very long travel uh, before getting to its uh, position for observing. Um, and to tell you a little bit about who I am, um, I just wanted to share a few pictures with you. So I'm an astronomer and astrophysicist working at the Canada France Hawaii Telescope. Uh, it's one of the Mauna Kea Observatory. And um, the pictures that you see right now are some of the pictures from me, uh, of me uh, working at the summit. Uh, I, do, uh, I do work sometimes up there, but most of the time I'm in Waimea in my office working with data. And I work with uh, about 50 other employees who have different expertise. And you see a couple of pictures of them working at the summit here. And I'm from Canada. Uh, I moved here about four and a half years ago and I'm an Inu, so it's one of the First Nation of Canada. Uh, I'm a member of the Pequot Camille Nuits Nation. It is in Quebec, so the east coast of Canada. And I'm showing pictures right there on the slide. Uh, of our hunting camp. I was actually there two months ago. I go back every year, we go hunt for moose and it's by far my favorite place in the world. Um, so you have an idea of what it looks like. So we have the camp here, there's a lake right in front of it, many lakes and river in our area. And uh, of course we're tracking uh, moose, but we sometimes see wolf track. And I also found an arrowhead in the lake uh, about two years ago. And um, uh, let me just check quickly the chat. I see that there's some activity here. Third grade, that's awesome. Awesome. So um, yeah, this is a little bit about, about me. And I 
studied their physics and astronomy at a small observatory that is called Momegatsik. Uh, so you have a picture right there and we do have very harsh winter. So this is a picture in the middle of the winter. We get a lot of snow and ice, just like we get here sometimes on the Monakia. And yesterday was actually the first day of the year that we got snow up there. Uh, so we're monitoring the activity, but this, um, uh, this weekend we should get even more snow on the Monakia. So take a look at the summit once, it, once it's clear out and uh, you'll see it, it's, it's getting pretty white and pretty. <laughs> and so I moved here from Canada all the way up to Hawaii to work here as an astronomer and, and uh, do, my, do what I like. It's really my, my passion. And, um, and I study star forming uh, regions uh, with the instrument CITEL that I am uh, specialized with. Um, so today is going to be a little bit different. I'm going to talk to you about the James Webb Telescope, but also why we need telescopes in space uh, and how the telescopes that are on Earth, like the one we have on the Manakia, kind of complete each other uh, in studying the universe around us and trying to understand how our universe works. And so this is a picture of the Canada France Hawaii telescope, one of the Manakia uh, telescope. And um, if we go inside, this is what we have, the telescope. It's a big piece of uh, metal that is uh, very heavy <laughs> and everything can move and point in direction, uh, every direction on the sky, uh, which is a little bit different than how the James Webb telescope is gonna be operating, but it's a similar uh, object. It has mirrors that collects light uh, it enables us to see things that are very faint, far away in space. And um, now we're going to dive in into why uh, do we wanted to have another telescope in space? Why did we wanted the James Webb Telescope to be launched? And how it will be different? And what can we learn from a telescope like the James Webb Telescope? And one of the things that is very important to understand uh, is about what kind of light this telescope is going to be looking at. And um, the video you see right now is a video of the night sky on the Monakia. So you see the motion of stars going above uh, the Monakia. It's accelerated. Of course, it's very fast compared to the normal motion of stars. But we see this visible light, the light from all the colors that we can see with our eyes, the blue, the red, the greens, going through the atmosphere of the Earth and being uh, detected on our telescope on the Monakia. But if we wanted to look at a different kind of light, and I'm talking here about the infrared light. It's a little bit more tricky. So this is a picture of the night sky with an uh, infrared camera or those cameras that they use to see at night. Um, and so you see the sky is very bright in the infrared. You see like that bright green coming out of the sky. So the sky actually glows in this different kind of light, the infrared light. And if we look, at the light uh, in the infrared with our cameras, we, we actually do have cameras at our telescope that looks the infrared light. What we actually see if we look for too long is a completely blasted image because the sky is so bright. And so it is very hard to see galaxies that are beyond the atmosphere of the earth while you're observing from the land, from, from, from the, the ground level. And therefore, launching something into space to be able to go through the atmosphere and like really get only the light coming from space without this, this bright emission from our own sky enables us to see things that are hiding behind. And this is where uh, the James Webb Telescope become really, really interesting. And this is true for a lot of different kinds of light. So now on this image, uh, if you look at the bottom, you'll see uh, a wave which represents the light. And the light, the visible light, the one we are used to see are the different colors from the rainbow. It contains a lot of information that we can study. And there's uh, also, if you look at the higher energy light past the UV, like past the purple, you have the UV and then you have gamma ray and X-rays. X-rays are even the light that they use in the hospital to take image of your bones. So it's really high energy light that you can't see with your eyes, but it's out there. And this kind of light is unable to go through the atmosphere of the earth. So you cannot have a telescope on the Monakia capable of detecting UV or X-ray or gamma rays because everything is blocked like a shield by our atmosphere. And it's a bit similar for the infrared. There's a little like bits of, there are bits of windows that you can look through and uh, some of the light can go through, but not all of it. And then if we go all the way up to the very 
long waves of light, the radio waves, then we can again start to see things and we have telescope on the land that are focusing on this kind of light. And it's actually the same kind of light that is used for the radio on, in your car <laughs> and that you detect with the antenna on your, uh, of your car. And beyond that, there's another realm of the radio uh, like light that we cannot see on Earth. But we're trying to catch everything. So of course, we can see a little bit of the visible light on Earth and a little bit of the infrared. And we actually have facilities up there on the Monakia that are specialized in doing so. So we have some telescope that observe visible and a little bit of the infrared very close by light. And then telescopes that are doing very close to the radio wave of the light. But in between, right there, there's actually a lot of stuff to observe and very interesting things, but we don't have anything or we cannot observe it from the land. We need to, to launch things in space for that. And so we've been launching telescopes in space for a while. <laughs> the first one uh, that I want to point out is the Hubble Space Telescope. It's been like a tremendous amount of information that we got from this telescope that was launched in the 90s. And a little bit later, we got another telescope. And this one was to observe a little bit of the ultraviolet light, the visible light, and near infrared, just, just like our telescopes actually that are on the ground, but a little bit better. And then Chandra was observing that super high energy light, the x-rays that we cannot detect here. And then eventually they sent another one, which was called Spitzer. And Spitzer was actually observing infrared. Um, and it's been observing for quite a while now. And we've learned a lot of things from Spitzer. But if we want to compare them, we need to check out the size of their, uh, their mirror. And so, um, oh, I don't have it here. But the size of the mirror of the different telescope is not comparable. So Spitzer was very, very small. And the Webb telescope is going to be gigantic. It's going to have a 6.5 meter mirror uh, made out of gold. And we're going to see that. And through all of these telescopes, using all of these telescopes, We've learned a lot of things. Uh, we've been able to detect things in space that we have never detected before. We have been able to make images of those objects in such a clear way uh, that was really like unprecedented. And so we've really learned a lot. And it, it's why the James Webb Telescope is so exciting because we're going to get a new window again to see our universe. And so the James Webb is specialized looking in the, the infrared light. And so the infrared light is just past the visible. It's right there. Uh, so Hubble Space was observing that window here with the colors of the visible light, the color of the rainbow. Spitzer was also looking the infrared, but not quite exactly the same colors of the infrared. And this is where the James Webb Telescope is. And ah, perfect. That's the image I, was, I wanted to, to have here. So I, I was telling you how Spitzer was much smaller versus the web. So this is the size of the mirror of the Spitzer telescope, not even a meter wide. And Hubble right here with the 2.4 meter, and then Webb with this gigantic honeycomb-like mirror, 6.6 uh, .6 meter, actually. And so the comparison is like, it's almost impossible because there's so much more light collected by a large mirror like that, that we can see things that are super faint out there in the universe, and only a few particles of light are getting all the way to, to the Earth. So to detect those tiny little galaxies that are super far away, we need to collect their light efficiently. And that's what this mirror is going to be doing. So why do we want to study that infrared light? Um, so there's one thing that is super cool with the infrared light is that it's not necessarily associated with the same kind of uh, science. So People are used to see the visible light. So when we look with our own eyes, the nature around us, we see all the colors and we see animals and things like that. But what the infrared light can be telling you is more information about the same thing. So if we look at the same image, but now using infrared goggles, um, we would actually see information about temperature, for instance. So we have the mirgrats here that are warm uh, blooded animals, so they are really bright in the infrared uh, because their body temperature is really high. And then the crocodile, who is a cold-blooded animal, will be almost the same color as the rest of the, the landscape. And so in the infrared, they look so much more different. And you can have extra information on Earth 
when you use those infrared goggles just as much as when you're in space and looking at different objects. So now I'm showing you a star forming region. And actually, this is exactly what the kind of region I would be studying. Um, and this region here um, is forming stars. There's clouds of gas that are really thick. And in within those clouds of gas, there's a lot of little particles, atoms, elements that are interacting with each other because of the force of gravity. And the force of gravity is pulling everything together to form stars. And when they do, they are kind of hiding into that cloud. It's like um, very hazy. You can't really see through if you're looking in the visible light. But if you're looking with your infrared goggle or with the uh, James Webb telescope, you'll be able to peer through the cloud and see what's behind. And if you're really careful and you look this column of gas here, you see a few stars that are like visible like in the back. But now if you look in the infrared, look how much brighter they are and how many more you can see. And so that's, that's something that is very peculiar about the infrared light. It travels through the matter that the visible light cannot travel through. So you can see things really, really deep into clouds of gas and things that would normally block everything. And another thing is that a lot of uh, atoms and molecules and things in space, very small things in that gas, that is surrounding star is actually emitting a lot of infrared light, especially mid what we call mid infrared light. So a little bit closer to the radio waves. And so that light is actually emitted by atoms and molecules and little particles in space. And depending on what kind of molecules you have, uh, it could be water like H2O is a molecule, the water molecule, or it could be CO, the carbon oxygen molecule. So those molecules have very specific signature that they emit into the mid infrared light. And you can observe them uh, with the web telescope. And it tells you a little bit about what's out there. Um, and we're actually very curious about that. Um, so that's one of the things that is, is going to be studied with the web telescope. And this is just another example of a different nebulae here forming stars. Uh, where we have those thick clouds of gas in the visible uh, light, you have these bright regions surrounding the newly formed stars. And then on the other side, in the infrared side, you can see through and see what's behind, that was hiding behind. And that's very important. And um, okay, so how do we capture the, this infrared light, this faint infrared light coming from space? So for sure, getting out of the Earth atmosphere is the first step. So sending a telescope into space, yes. But then we want to gather, collect light and produce very deep image of the very far away objects. And that's one of the main thing that the Hubble Space Telescope that was launched before did in, at first. So Hubble, when it was sent out, stared at one corner of the universe for a very long time and collected the light from that spot for very like many hours and produced what we called the deep field, the Hubble deep field. And we could detect within a single image thousands and thousands of galaxies that are at different distances from us with different colors. And even later, they decided to, to go beyond the ultra deep, deep field. And um, they did the Hubble ultra deep field. So they stare even longer into the same area of the sky and they look. And everywhere they would look, they would see galaxies. And one of the things also that is very interesting with all of those images, and when you study all these galaxies separately, you can notice a few of them that are very red and actually very intriguing. And those galaxies that are, oh, sorry about that, very red and very intriguing are emitting a lot of infrared light. And those galaxies are also known to be further away. And we're going to see why is that. And so I made a little animation here. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, about why we see those faraway galaxies very red. So this yellow galaxy in the center, let's imagine it's us, it's the Milky Way. And wherever we look around us, we see galaxies of different colors, different shape. And one of the first thing astronomers noticed when they were looking at those galaxies is that most of them, if not all of them, were moving away from us. <laughs> and so that's kind of strange. Um, and also, they noticed that the farthest the galaxy is from us, the faster it's actually moving away from us. That's kind of strange as well. <laughs> but there's a reason for that. 
and um, uh, the discovery of why our universe is actually expanding is very well tightly related to that observation. So if we have the Milky Way there and there's a first galaxy close by, it's moving away from us because the space in between us and that galaxy is also expanding. So the galaxy is not actually going away. It's space between galaxies that is getting larger. And if a galaxy is twice as far, then there's twice as much space between us. Uh, it'll look like it's going twice as fast. And so um, this is how we discovered the universe was expanding. Hubble participated to that. Uh, it, it's a, an astronomer uh, that made those first observations. There was others also uh, from Europe, Le Maître, uh, that, that did this connection between the observation of Hubble and why our universe is expanding. It really changed the way we see our universe. But we're going to see even like why like the Webb telescope is going to probably blow our mind even more than these discoveries because um, these galaxies, the farthest ones from us, um, they are moving away from us very, very fast. And because of that, light coming from these galaxies that are super far away is traveling a lot of space and that space is expanding. And as light travels through that space and space expands, it also stretched the light. So light that was once probably emitted in the visible light or the X-rays or the UV light got stretched to the infrared light and the radio waves. And so those galaxies, we cannot see in the visible light. We can only see them with infrared light and radio waves. And so a telescope like Webb will be able to see those galaxies that are super far away. But not only they are far away, is that the light took so much time to get to us, to travel from where it was emitted, those galaxies super far away, all the way up to the Earth. It took billions of years. And so when we see those galaxies, we see what they look like billions of years ago. So that's the light that was emitted billions of years ago when the universe was itself very young. So ga these galaxies were young and we see that light coming from the early universe. And this is uh, super exciting because we will have a picture of what our universe looked like billions and billions of years ago. And so it's looking at, uh, at galaxies back in time and looking at those first galaxy using the Webb telescope, using at the, 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 the wavelength, the infrared wavelength coming from those galaxies. Okay, so let's see how we can explore this with Webb. And to get uh, to understand how this is super important for our understanding of the universe, I'm going to show you a, a couple of videos um, for you to kind of have a grasp of what happened in the universe since the beginning. Um, and so this first video is showing you the early uh, beginning of the universe. So when the universe started, um, we have to go back in time. So everything was closer together, right? So the universe is expanding right now, but in the past, it was all condensed in a very small area. And so everything was foggy. There was no stars, no galaxy. It was just gas. And it took a long time for things to change. And it's mainly because of the force of gravity that things evolved to what we know as the universe today. And this image is more like the universe right now. So you see like lots of filaments that contains billions of galaxies in which there's billions of stars. But let's me, let me just start that video again to get back into that fuzzy state when the universe was just gas. And that gas was actually very simple. It was mostly very light elements. So if you look at the very tiniest bits of matter you can look at, the atoms, you had hydrogen and a little bit of helium. Those are very light elements. There was nothing else, no water yet, no carbon, no oxygen, <laughs> nothing that we uh, are familiar with. But that early universe evolved and changed through this process of glow like forming stars using the force of gravity and those stars contributed to form new elements like oxygen carbon eventually molecules uh, that that really spread around in the universe so a very different universe than what we know right now and it's kind of um, a curiosity for scientists we want to be able to see that state of the universe this is just a simulation from a computer it's not observation it's things 
the way we think they happen. Um, but the web telescope might be able to um, give us a, a like a, a window into what happened in the very, very far past of the universe. And one of the first thing that is that has happened back then in that cloud of AZ gas is the formation of the first star in the universe. So this is a video now that shows what happened when the gas eventually form a star. So there's a moment when this object in the center will light up and produce light. And that's when the star is born. And it's actually a very interesting phenomenon that happens in the star for that to happen. So you need enough matter to be able to compress those little atoms together. And eventually they start to fuse with each other. And when atoms combine, they create other atoms, even heavier, like carbon and oxygen and things like that. And when they do that, they also produce a lot of light. And this is why every star in the universe is shining. And they are contributing to transforming our universe and also pushing a lot of energy with their light out there. And so, you see here on this video that kind of bubble that the star has created once it's lit up, but it's still confined within the gas, like within that hazy cloud of gas. And we can't really see through unless we're looking into the infrared light. And so um, we're actually trying to pierce through the early phase of the universe when the universe was hazy. And we would like to be able to see those first star and to be able to do that, we need to look at the infrared light coming from super far away in the universe. And so that first light that lit up the universe and started to shine was kind of trapped. But eventually, the first stars that were inside the first small galaxies that gathered together, um, they eventually shine and actually pierce through the cloud as well and dissipate that haze, uh, enabling us to see through. And that's why we see other galaxies with the visible light now today with the Hubble Space, Space Telescope and things like that. And I like this image here. This is an artistic rendering of what the first galaxy might have looked like. Um, we cannot take images of those galaxies. They're too far away. Uh, and um, they are small, they're kind of irregular, they're forming a lot of stars, but they're so different than what we know of the local universe and the neighboring galaxies around us. And so being able to glimpse at them would be kind of great. And the, the James Webb will be able to, to observe thousands of them, probably more than that even. And galaxies like that, the small galaxies that we've just seen, they change through time. And now we're gonna see a video of how galaxies through time, they merge with each other to form larger and larger galaxy, like eventually a galaxy like the Milky Way, like ours. And so the, all these little clumps are actually small galaxies that contains thousands, maybe tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of stars. And then because of the force of gravity, they're attracted by each other in space and they merge and they form stars through that process and they transform. And the blue little dots here shows newly formed star. Um, where, whereas the red dots are showing older stars that have been there for a while. And in green, you still see all the gas and those atoms that are floating around. And of course, this is super accelerated and it's again a simulation from a computer, but it helps us understanding what might have happened since the beginning of the universe, which was about 13.7 uh, billion years ago. And when we look at this final galaxy, that kind of look a little bit like the Milky Way, um, it's good to remind ourselves. So each time a galaxy like that rotates once on itself, it takes 250 million years. So for the Milky Way to do one turn is 250 million years. That's a lot of time. So in that video, every turn you see is, yeah, it's lot, there's billions of years of evolution here uh, to get to a galaxy like this. So from the beginning of the universe, we had those first stars creating those little bubbles starting to shine, eventually forming uh, the first galaxies, which was were small and irregular and kind of clumsy. And then eventually with the light produced from all these stars formed in galaxies, those little bubbles started to dissipate the A's from the early universe. And we got what we know as the universe today with all the galaxy that we can see through. But now 
we have this this kind of um, you know good timing with the James Webb because within with using the infrared light that enables us to peer through clouds and see through as well as seeing objects like galaxies that are super far away that are actually super bright in the infrared because their light was stretched by the expansion of the universe, combining these two phenomena, we'll actually be able to probably detect the first stars and the first galaxies that are embedded into that haze of the early uh, universe. And that's that has never been done before. It's super exciting. And we don't know what it's going to look like exactly. We have ideas, but we need to confirm that with a real observation of what it looked like. And one thing that is super intriguing for me, who is stu studying star forming regions and newly formed star, and especially massive star, is that People think, with the observation we have today of stars, that those first stars were completely different than the one we have today. Some of them were monsters, like gigantic stars that cannot form anymore because the universe has been transformed uh, and is now composed of a lot of elements like ox oxygen and carbon that was formed by other stars. And so to go back in time and get into those conditions where you had only the very small elements before stars starting to mix things around those stars were probably like a thousand times more massive than the sun and they were super bright and um they didn't live long and they probably exploded and fabricated and and like um and and then became black holes like probably like quite massive black holes actually and so we want to look into this and try to, to understand how it happened okay so let's talk about the telescope itself now um and just to say, like the James Webb Telescope has been built by many people from many different countries, and this is just a map that shows all the different partners, uh, and even Hawaii right here, uh, that have contributed to building this telescope since the, since the start of its uh, fabrication in the 90s. And the early design was, you know, a rough idea of what we wanted this telescope to be like, but of course it evolved and became the telescope that we have now today. And this telescope is a real in, um, engineering challenge. It, com it is composed of many, many different components that enables it to see through uh, and see far. <laughs> and um, uh, this is an image that shows you like the scale of it. Uh, you see like some people are uh, standing on the side. So this is the size of the telescope compared to, to, uh, to human size. And, this uh, right here is the big sail that protects the telescope from the sunlight. And we're gonna check out a little closer here, um, all the components that are uh, included in the Webb telescope. So you have this gigantic golden eye mirror <laughs> that collects the light from space. You have a tinier mirror uh, up there. So the light is reflected on this big mirror, goes back into this secondary mirror. And then this beams all the light collected into uh, this opening here, which leads to the cameras uh, that are on board of the James Webb telescope. Um, you also have the solar shield that looks like a sail. And all the instruments are hiding behind here. Um, and we can see part of the, the what's behind uh, behind the solar shield. So you have a star tracker, so the telescope know where it is. Um, you do have the uh, antenna, very uh, practical if you want to kind of communicate with her, right? Um, you have uh, the solar power uh, array, which enables it to get energy from the sun as well. And the mirror, the golden mirror, is uh, made out of multiple segments of, uh, that are uh, honeycomb like and uh, they're much larger again than the Hubble uh, primary mirror right here in comparison. And why do we want to observe the infrared light with a gold mirror? <laughs> that you might want to <laughs> wonder why. Um, so gold is actually very good at reflecting infrared light. When we build mirror for telescopes here on the Mauna Kea, we usually use aluminum, sometimes silver, uh, for the mirror because it is reflecting a lot of the visible light very well, as well as close infrared light. And that's what we need here. Uh, it's the exact window that we have from the Earth atmosphere. But if we want to look at the infrared, then the, the gold mirror is what we need. It's the key. So here you have a segment of gold mirror uh, that is reflecting a source of infrared light 
it's pretty bright. And this is a mirror, a typical mirror segment with uh, aluminum or, um, uh, or silver, uh, where you can see your own reflection in, in the visible light. So this golden eye is really perfect to, to gather and collect infrared light from space. And so Webb is gonna be launched on the 22nd. We're just crossing our fingers, this is not gonna change. If the weather is not permitting, they're gonna push the launch for another date. It has to be perfect. And it will take months before starting gathering data because it's going away from us. And it will also unfold. Uh, all the different pieces are gonna take place. And once it's re ready to observe at its uh, spot, um, we're gonna start getting data. And it's uh, gonna be in an orbit a little bit further away from Earth. Uh, it's called Lagrange 2 or L2. It's a very stable orbit that is not too affected by the Earth, the Sun, the other planets that could pull uh, the telescope from its orbit uh, because of their gravity. Uh, so it's a really sweet spot to put a telescope. And um, of course, it's going to communicate with us. It's going to send us data from space, and it's going to do so uh, using the different command center that are on Earth uh, and uh, with its antenna. And then the, the scientists are going to analyze the data and do their science. Um, which I am super excited about. It's going to take a few months before we get the first result, but we'll get them pretty soon. And the web has different camera. Uh, just like the telescope that we have here, I am specialized with a camera called CITEL, but we have five on our telescope, and they're doing different things. And the web telescope also have uh, those five instruments that are specialized in looking at different kind of science. And they also have different... Uh, uh, aperture or, or window. There are, some of them are uh, looking at large windows and some of them have smaller windows, but they do different things. They also look at the light, the infrared light slightly differently. Some are looking at the what we call the near infrared light. And we have one instrument that are in the mid infrared light looking at those molecules uh, in the star forming regions, for instance. So it's gonna, okay, it enables us to discover some of the first galaxy that I mentioned but also at the, m many other things actually. <laughs> and so it will actually um, enables us to kind of create a flipbook of all the galaxy over time since the beginning of the universe. Uh, it will look at the far away galaxies, but just as much as it will look at the closest ones, uh, it's just that the closest ones, we're actually gonna see the infrared light that they are currently emitting. Uh, and, and, and the light has not been stretched as much uh, for them because they're close by. Um, and so the science of studying the evolution of those galaxies, how the small galaxy eventually became larger, and how the stars are forming inside those galaxies through time. Um, it will also detect black holes, uh, black holes from the early universe and trying to understand why uh, there are so many of them. Why do we have black holes that are uh, a little bit larger than what we normally would form from uh, the death of the massive stars? And also why we have those super massive black hole in the center of galaxies like Povehi that was observed uh, also with observatories around the planet, but uh, using some of the observatory on, on the Mauna Kea. Um, so why do we have those Povehi, uh, this Povehi black hole and others? We will gather information about the stars formation, like exactly what I do. So I'm super intrigued with the first data set that will be looking into those star formation region um, because I'll be able to detect atoms, little particles and molecules into those clouds and see how the first molecules form and how I'll I'll they also get destroyed from the light coming from the star. Um, and this is just another image showing like a star forming regions and, you know, when they get older, they, they tend to dissipate those clouds and destroy molecules. Uh, so they become a little bit clearer, but then uh, we need to understand a little bit that process. And we will also reobserve the very own planet of our solar system. Uh, this is an image of Jupiter in the infrared light uh, using Gemini telescope on the, the Mauna Kea. Uh, so we'll be able to do even better than this and look through uh, the clouds of Jupiter and understand what is the atmosphere of Jupiter like. Um, so those are just a few example. And just to finish, um, one of the things that is very important about James Webb is that 
we will be able to detect new exoplanets. So planets that are orbiting other stars near to us, but also a little bit further away. And not only we will detect new planets that orbits other star, but we will also be able to decode and analyze what's in their atmosphere. So what are the, the gases? Can Are those atmosphere uh, uh, like good for life? Uh, is there's the same kind of uh, molecules that we find on Earth? Uh, and that is definitely something that we've never been able to do before. Um, so we'll study this, the, these, these planets that are nearby and try to see if they can harbor life. Uh, and so I can't wait to see uh, what will be the, the, the results from that. And just to finish, um, you know, uh, since I moved here, I've learned a lot about the community here and the relationship with, uh, you know, the universe and our understanding of the universe. And in the very chant, the Kamulipo chant from the Hawaiian um, uh, cosmogony, uh, this, this chant is super important, and it actually talks about the beginning of the universe. Uh, it's the beginning in deep darkness. So those early moments when there was no light, no star. And um, of course, I cannot explain it in great detail, um, but I want to point out a very, very good presentation uh, that was given by Larry Kimura. Uh, and it's talking about this relationship that we have with the stories of creation and the early beginning of the universe. And one of the verse in the Kumuli Po chant is actually talking about uh, the born first light. And so the James Webb telescope is in its own way going to be looking through uh, and trying to find this first light coming from the first stars and first galaxy. And I like to think that even though those chants are coming from our past, it's going to enable us to see what's going to come in our future as well. Um, and we have our own story in Canada also uh, from my community uh, about the first light and all across the world actually. Uh, people around the planet, communities, have talked about this moment when light was created. And I think the James Webb Telescope is going to be able to give us a glimpse at it, uh, which is super exciting. So I hope you like the presentation. That's all I had today. And I will be happy to answer any questions you guys have about space, any of the objects that I'm I was talking about, or the telescope itself. Thank you so much. Wow. Thank you, Lori. What an informative presentation. We're looking forward to the launch this later this month. We have a few minutes now for questions and we apologize in advance if we run out of time to answer every question. Here's the first one. Why does the expanding universe push galaxies away from each other, but gravity pulls individual stars together to form galaxies? That is such a good question. So it's all about scale. So, you know, when we're trying to see the expansion of the universe, like the space actually expanding, you actually need to look quite far away. The nearest galaxies to us are at sometimes millions of light year away. In comparison, a star nearby would be, or a cloud of gas nearby would be maybe a hundred light year away from us or a thousand light year away. And at those distance, gravity is strong enough to pull things back together. But when you're far that far, then it's the, the, the space expansion is just winning. Um, you have so much space in between that it's actually expanding far faster than what gravity can pull things back together. Okay. So that's why uh, it's so different. Thank you. Um, now a question from Waimea. How can NASA fix the web telescope since it's so far away if something goes wrong? Yeah, you can't. Yeah, you just cross your finger. You can't fix it. There's no gonna. There's gonna be no recovery mission. It has to work. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, that's one. Uh, yeah, other thing with the, this this uh, endeavor. It's very complex. It's just going there, and we hope all the instruments are gonna work. That everything's gonna unfold. There's so many moving parts in that telescope. It's stressful, you know, for a scientist that uh, that has been waiting for this for decades to happen. If anything goes wrong, we might be in trouble. But we hope that uh, everything goes well. And you know, so far we've demonstrated with other telescopes that uh, engineers and scientists on this planet are capable to do that. Uh, so I have total trust in their ability to uh, complete this, and we'll see what happened on December, uh, well, past December 22nd, once they're unfolding the parts. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, 
How do you control the position of the telescope in space? Without friction, how does it stay still or stop moving when it's repositioned? It's a very good question. So um, they have systems that we call gyroscope. Uh, and uh, you can probably Google it if you want like, to see like images of that because I don't have any slides for that. Um, and they can also push a little bit of air uh, on the side, but gyroscope are the main tool. So it's basically weights that are located at different position and they can change their location, how far they are from the telescope. And because of its rotation and the position of the weight, it changes its inclination and its position. It's a little bit like I have a chair that can rotate. You can do this at home, like my chair can rotate. Oh, it's not gonna work. Okay. And if you can find a chair like that, you can play with weights. Like if you have like five pounds or 10 pound weights at home, you can try to keep like rotates and keep them close to you and then try to stretch your arm and put the weight really far away. Then your chair is gonna slow down. It's basically the same kind of uh, physics that leads those gyroscopes to, to control the motion of the telescope, slow it down. And there's some in different directions. Okay. Another one, how will the web communicate with scientists on earth? Yeah, so antennas and light. So it's sending back signals to earth. Uh, and, and then we collect that signal, just like we do communication with, uh, you know, Wi-Fi uh, or uh, uh, radio uh, communication. So of course it takes time to get back to, to earth. It's delayed by a few minutes. I don't have the exact count of number of minutes uh, delay, uh, but you can look it up. And then uh, we get that information in the, the control center and people are analyzing the data and returning it to the science community for doing more uh, discoveries. Yeah. What will the web's first targets be? What will you be first looking for? You know, those topics I presented uh, are the ones that are already accepted for observing. Uh, so they do have each of these kind of discoveries have a block of time allocated on the web telescope. And um, of course, there's, um, you know, the telescope is not going to point in every direction and change position uh, every second because it takes a lot of energy. And we need to uh, keep that energy. So it's going to slowly drift and observe things as it's going. And some of the project will get more data than others first. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't have the list of priority, or, but it's gonna be kind of all happening together at the same time. And they're gonna collect data about all these different objects as it goes. Okay. Oh, let's see. Hold on, we're pulling up another question. <laughs> okay. How long will the um, web mission last? Is it yeah. for five years? It's going to be years. You know, Spitzer was 20 years. Sometimes it's hard to tell exactly when it's going to stop because uh, it's all about the amount of energy that we spend to move the telescope. So we do hope it's going to be decades uh, for the web telescope, but eventually it will uh, run out of energy. So we'll have a lot of data, uh, hopefully, uh, by that time. Okay. Um, can you refer um, us to someone who does stargazing from your own home? I went to a birthday party years ago and they hired someone to do stargazing at the party. Uh, that's a good question. You know, I know a lot of friends that work around the telescopes that love to do that. Um, and we do have an outreach um, uh, email uh, that you can send a request to. Uh, and often uh, we just stand, we receive those emails, like all staff email that say, hey, are, would you be available to uh, entertain uh, like the, this group for, for about a few hours? And we usually have volunteers uh, pretty easily. So uh, you, you feel free to contact us uh, at our telescope, but also other telescopes. If you're closer to Hilo, uh, then you might want to contact uh, people that works at uh, uh, the Gemini Observatory or the Subaru Observatory and things like that. They will find uh, uh, someone that would love to to entertain your party and discuss stargazing. <laughs> That's awesome. Do, do other countries have um, a similar telescope or going to launch anything similar? Not exactly or near like the James Webb. It's it's very unique. You know, uh, the amount of effort and the cost of such a telescope is very large. Just to give you an idea, uh, to build it, it was close to eight billions of dollars and to uh continue you know using it and the control center and maintain like all the, the you know continue analyzing the data 
you add almost another $2 billion for the next decades to come. So um, uh, we don't duplicate this, these kinds of effort. We are doing it all together, all the countries together, and everybody's going to benefit from it. Uh, that's really the idea here. A personal question for me. What happens to the telescope at the end of its run? Does it just stay in space orbiting or does it come back to Earth? Yeah, I, it? yeah that's a very jump? good question. I didn't check this out for the web. You know, it's either it stays there mm -hmm. or it's taken out of orbit. Mm -hmm. For the ones that are very close to the Earth, uh, the ones that are orbiting around us very close by, they're usually slowly uh, like falling into the Earth and then like they actually predict where they're gonna fall. And as soon as they touch the atmosphere, it's like a fireball or a meteorite. It's, a, it's it, dis it disintegrate and some parts are falling down. Oh. So we have a little bit of that, but still some are just hanging out there. And it's actually an issue when in the future, we're gonna have to uh, probably navigate through some of the satellites that are out there that are not working anymore. Mm -hmm. And they're gonna be in the way if you wanna put something else. <laughs> so uh, I, I can't wait to see what's gonna be the solution for that. <laughs> okay, this is our last question. Um, earlier, uh, a participant did get to see the slide too well, and he is wondering about the orbit of the telescope. Is it around the Earth or in orbit around the Sun? Orbit around the Sun. That's yeah. That picture was like a little bit out of scale, right? Um, so it's very far away from us, and it's around the Sun. It's orbiting around the Sun, somewhere in between the Earth and Mars. And um, the L two um, uh, orbit is just like I was saying, like in kind of equilibrium with the pull from the inner planets and the Sun, and the pull from the outer planets. Uh, so yeah, much farther away. Oh, great. Well, thank you, Lori. And thank you all for joining us today and making time to listen to her great little speech and, and sharing with us. And for all of us at Thelma Parker Memorial Public Library, mahalo and aloha. Mahalo.